make the data lit, make the data lit, learn from it. Now open your eyes, open your eyes and visualize because intuitive numbers drive enterprise. This is Colin Scow and welcome to Data Lit Week 3 Python Visualization Tutorial. Once upon a time, long, long ago, your ancestors spent most of their days hunting and gathering food. They didn't have much time to worry about numbers, and the little study time they did have was constantly interrupted by tiger attacks. Hands were adequate for just about anything important that needed to be counted, and toes were a reliable backup solution for those with more than 10 kids. But eventually, the whole struggle for survival all day every day started to get lame, so people decided to farm because that produced more food with less work. The whole nudist thing also got old as wise people figured some things are best left to the imagination. So some people decided they'd rather make clothes and farm. Then tools and a bunch of cool other things were invented. And suddenly the people who made all those cool things wanted to trade them for food to eat. And then it became really hard to keep track of and hands and toes were no longer enough to track the economic output of the global economy. And then someone invented math and accounting to make sure complex trades stayed fair. But humans up to that point mainly focused on bare survival found complex numbers hard to think with. And the clay tablet graph was born. And a bit later paper made it even easier. And in the 1980s Microsoft Excel and dot matrix printers made the pencil and ruler obsolete for anyone with six grand and 1980s money to blow. Visualization has one purpose. It makes data easier to understand and think with, and the entire point of data science is to understand and make sense of your data and use it to make meaningful predictions. Fast forward to 2019 and there's a ton of open source data visualization libraries which will interface with any programming language of your choice. Data visualization libraries can be divided into two categories. Raster graphics, they output an image made of pixels. This generally looks ugly if you try to zoom in on it and it's not interactive. Python examples include the classic matplotlib and seaborn. Then there's vector graphics. This outputs graphics defined by mathematical equations rather than pixels. Vector charts can be zoomed in on and look beautiful and can also be interactive allowing you to play with the data inside the chart. Python examples include bokeh and plotly. Instead of an image, they output an HTML file that can be loaded in a web browser. You can also export charts in SVG format and load them in design programs like Adobe Illustrator to spice up. Python is the de facto language of data science and the graphing libraries all have very similar APIs. So once you know one, the rest aren't hard to figure out. For this tutorial, we're going to use Bokeh since it's beautiful, vector based, can make just about every imaginable kind of chart. It's easy to add interactivity and it's simple to learn and there's great documentation. So let's get started with a hello world tutorial and we'll use Google Colab. This is my preferred way to mess around with Python since it's free and you can also use free Google GPUs and the brand new tensor processing units as well. Let's create a new Colab notebook. To maximize your learning, I recommend you follow along and pause the video to type in the code. You're going to learn a lot better if you type the commands yourself rather than copy and paste. The muscle memory of typing seems to help a lot with learning the code. Bokeh is installed by default on Colab, but if you need a library that isn't, you can simply use exclamation followed by pip install to get the packages you need. The simplest graph possible is just an array of values for the x-axis with an array of corresponding values for the y-axis. With Colab, you've got to run the output notebook function in each cell where you want to display a graph. Create a new graph and set the title and labels. Add a line render with a legend and set the line thickness. And finally, we show the results. Notice you can also pan and zoom around the graph. So that was very simple. Are you ready for something a bit more challenging? We just made a two-dimensional line chart using the dimensions of time and temperature. Now let's get a little bigger, say five dimensions. How do you visualize the evolution of countries? 
we're going to reproduce a famous animated infographic from an iconic TED Talk by Hans Rosling, which allows us to instantly gain an understanding of some very complex data. In the 1960s, there was an obvious divide between first world and third world countries. The first world had small families and a high life expectancy. The third world had large families and died young. Over the next 50 years, something very miraculous happens. Let's take a brief look at what we're going to be building and then we'll get into the source code. Each circle represents a country. They're color coded by region. The size of the circle is proportional to the population. On the x-axis we have the average number of children per woman. So the countries on the right side of the graph are having lots of children. The y-axis is the life expectancy. Higher up people live longer. We've got four dimensions of data on one screen. It's quite clever. The fifth dimension is time. So let's see what happens when we push the play button. And we see most of the third world joining the first world. Virtually all countries see an improvement. The way this works is that a Python script launches a web server which generates the code for the page and streams in the data live. This won't run well on Colab, so let's set up your local computer. You'll need a recent version of Python 3 installed. You should be able to follow along perfectly if you're running Mac or Linux, but if you have Windows, you may need to adjust the commands a bit. The first thing we'll do is create a virtual environment which gives all your installed dependencies an isolated sandbox so they don't interfere with the other apps you're building. Open up a terminal in your home directory. Python 3-m vn and the directory. Then to activate it, you type source, put in the directory, slash bind, slash activate. Now let's install the dependencies. First, pip install wheel, then pip install numpy pandas bokeh. And we'll clone the bokeh repository. Git clone dash dash depth one and the repository URL. Now we're going to cd into the bokeh slash examples slash app folder. Now we've got to install the sample data. First, type python in the terminal to get an interactive shell. Then type import bokeh, enter, and bokeh.sampledata.download, open parentheses, close parentheses. Hit enter, wait for it to download, and then control D when everything is done. Finally, to run the app, you type in your terminal bokeh serve dash dash show gapminder, which will load the app that's in the gapminder folder. A browser window should open automatically. First, let's take a look at what the raw data looks like. This will help us understand what's going on as we go through the code. The files will be in a hidden folder called .bokeh in your home directory. You'll notice each dimension of data is in a separate file. We've got fertility, life expectancy, population, and regions. This file shows the fertility rates. Each row represents a country and each column represents a year. The first thing we need to do is pre-process the data to get it into the form required for processing. Let's take a look inside data.py. We load the four data files and get pandas CSV objects. The only real problem is that the years in the header are imported as strings and we need to convert them to integers. So we're creating a dictionary to remap the string years to integer years and we do that on all four files. Regions list is a list of all the unique regions taken from the group column of the regions file. And finally, recall that the size of the circle is proportional to the population. But making India 1.4 billion pixels wide would be a bit overkill, so we're going to scale it down a bit, but make sure all circles are no smaller than three pixels. And that's it. We export the clean data. Now let's look at main.py, which actually builds the interactive chart. After running the process data function, we just went over the next step is putting it all together into one object. The concat function on axis one literally pastes the spreadsheets together left to right. If you're confused about what's going on, I found the best way to understand is to paste the data into Colab and you can easily inspect the data at each step to see what's happening inside the transformations. The next transformation is a bit complex. But what's going on is that we create a dictionary called data with the years as a primary lookup. Then inside each year we have a list of countries indexed by number, the region they are a part of, the fertility rate, then life expectancy, and finally the adjusted population. And 
We're finished with the hard part and ready to build the chart. Remember, we're going to show just one year at a time and the user can scrub back and forth over the years to show the change. Initially, we're going to set the data source to the first year in our data set, which happens to be 1964. Column data source accepts a dictionary of arrays. Each year is a dictionary of fertility, life, population, and region. We can map these to various parts of the graph. Fertility is the x-axis. Life expectancy is on the y-axis. Population is the size of the circles, and region defines the color of the circles. Figure sets up the basic layout of the graph, including the title, size, and ranges for each axis. We then set up ticker intervals and labels for each axis. Then we set up a large label for the currently selected year in the lower left corner and add it to the layout. Next, we configure the color scheme that's going to be mapped to each region. We configure how the circles are going to look. The fill color is determined by the region and the mapping we just created. We also set up a legend to list all the regions by color. And here comes the first interactive element. We create a tooltip which displays the country name when you hover over each circle. Next comes a slider to select the year. The range is from the first year of our data set to the last with a step of one. Each frame of the animation increments the year and cycles back to the beginning when we go out of range. Every time the slider gets moved, we update the year label and switch our data source to that year. The onChange handler calls the update function. The animate function is simple. This is called whenever the play button is clicked. Cur doc is a reference to the current HTML document in the browser. If the animation is paused, we set up a timer to call the animate update function every 200 milliseconds, forwarding the frame. And if it's already playing, we remove the timer to stop the animation. Layout controls how the elements we've created are laid out on the page. There's a row with the chart and another row with the slider and button next to each other. We insert the layout into the HTML document and set the page title. Other notable files in this demo, there's a theme.yaml which controls subtle styling in our chart. All the details of how this works are of course in the bouquet documentation. And inside templates we have index.html which uses the Jinja Python templating language so you can put whatever you want on the page and insert your charts. A call to the super function embeds the chart. And finally there's styles.css which contains the basic styles for the HTML document. And I'm happy to announce we've got a winner winner chicken dinner on the last homework assignment. Michael Lester, also known as Nth Degree, put together a boss level notebook in Colab analyzing the airline statistics, graphing them in various ways including density plots. He concluded that Alaska was the airline most likely to get you to your destination on time, being late just 26.8% of the time. Michael then went on to demonstrate all four aspects of the central limit theorem very well. I'm going to post a link to his notebook at the bottom of the original assignment. Way to go, Michael. Keep up the good work, buddy. And this week, we're going to be running a visualization contest. Your task is to pick a data set that inspires you and explain slash visualize it in a creative way. You can use a Colab notebook or Python web server as I showed you above. Feel free to combine this contest with this week's homework assignment from our co-instructor Satish. Post your notebooks or GitHub links in the comments below and we'll pick the top three visualizations to showcase next week. Entries are due Sunday, February 17th at noon Pacific. This is Colin Scow signing off and I'll see you next week when we start diving into the meat of the course, regression. Meanwhile, stay smart and join us in our crusade because we are going to make data intuitive again. We are going to make data sexy again, and we are going to make data lit again.